So I wanted to thank you all for coming tonight. We've got a packed audience, which is always great uh, to uh, see this many faces out there. This is kind of a special night for us uh, as Storm Surge, because this is our fifth year of uh, putting on these sorts of programs. And uh, it's actually sort of an anniversary for Dr. Wake, because he was our first program when we started back in t uh, 2013. And so it's sort of an encore performance, I guess maybe an update from uh, his original uh, program back in, uh, in 2013. But I wanted to thank a bunch of our volunteers because Storm Surge is supported by all volunteers. And uh, especially Sheila Tainter, she carries a lot of the weight. She's actually doing some filming and she's going to be handing out the microphone for questions later on today. But she helps with the website and all of the promotions and the emails. We also have a couple of great writers now that are doing all our press releases for us. Uh, Judy Timon and uh, Gary Tyrone, which I don't think is here tonight. And then uh, Chris Cernick, of course, has really been pulling up a lot of the slack and helping us stay organized and taking a lot of the load off my back in terms of running the organization and filling a lot of the spots for uh, volunteers and, and various tasks that need to be done. So, you know, if, if you want to help out, we're always uh, open for volunteers. You know, come talk to me or Chris later on and we'll get you included. But anyway. Um, didn't want to uh, speak too much further, but wanted to bring Dr. Wake up here because we're running just a couple of minutes behind schedule and we do need to sort of wrap up on time. So uh, without further delay, Dr. Wake from the University of New Hampshire. Well, thank you. The mics are working. That's good. Uh, it's uh, great to be back five years later. Uh, I'd have to say that I don't remember everything that I said last time, but I'm pretty sure I said climate's changing and it's going to get warmer and wetter in the future. And that's exactly what's happening and that's the same message tonight. The rest is all details. Uh, I think the piece uh, that is uh, interesting is that in terms of identifying what potential solutions might be and testing those out in the path forward, I think we're much further along today compared to where we were uh, five years ago or maybe even uh, three years ago. So I'm going to try to get through the science and get to the solutions and actually uh, wrap up in 30 or 40 minutes so I can, we can have lots of time for questions and a discussion on how it is uh, we move forward on uh, this critical issue. If you uh, want to ask me a question um, and you don't want to raise your hand, you can actually, uh, if you're on Twitter, you can tag me and just tweet. And if I don't answer it tonight, I'll answer it uh, later on in the day. But we're trying to build a movement, right? So social media is important. Don't be shy. All right. I want to start by saying that I think climate change is the most important grand challenge of the 21st century. And I don't say that lightly. But I think that climate change makes every other grand challenge more difficult or impossible to address. So let me just give you a few examples. If you don't know, one in five children in our country, in the United States today, is food insecure, right? Allowing them to actually have some food security is one of our grand challenges. If you think around, uh, around the globe, there is even a higher percentage of children who are food insecure. It's going to be more difficult or impossible to address that issue in climate change because as the tropics heat up, it's going to be more and more difficult for people in the tropics where the vast majority of humanity lives to actually grow their food because it's going to be too hot. In addition to that, there's going to be an increase in the amount of drought and there's going to be an increase in the amount of floods which are going to make whatever crops they grow there actually sort of suffer as a result of these weather extremes. And as you're seeing right now, the issue of fire in some parts of the tropics is really serious. So addressing the issue of food insecurity is going to be more challenging in the future under climate change because where the vast majority of people live, they're going to be unable to grow the food to feed themselves. Uh, on a separate note, you might think that national security is the most important grand challenge that we face in the 21st century. Every four years, the Pentagon comes out with a quadrennial defense review. We should have one coming out soon, probably within the next month. But the last two, in 2010 and 2014, have identified climate change as a threat multiplier. So it's not that climate change drives conflict, but climate change <coughs> drives the aggravation that drives conflict. So you can think about environmental degradation or social tensions or political instability 
that climate change uh, uh, contributes to that then leads to conflict. And there have been some examples of this uh, around the world, although it's certainly hotly debated. But out of an 80-page 80, 80 report, the Pentagon uh, sets aside 8 to 10 pages to talk about this threat multiplier issue of climate change. So national security is going to be more difficult or impossible to address in the future because of our changing climate. On the other hand, you might think that preserving biodiversity is the most important grand challenge that we face, right? 500 million, maybe 3 billion years of evolution on the surface of the planet has, have given us this incredibly rich biodiversity, which is really sort of the fundamental ecosystems that provide us with everything that we love, including oxygen and soil, etc. Well, we are already undergoing the sixth major extinction right now. Actually, a big shout out if you haven't read Elizabeth Colbert's book, The Sixth Great Extinction, it's a fantastic book. I have all my students read it every year. I just think she's a wonderful writer. But we're already experiencing that, in part uh, started by uh, land use change, but now driven more and more by the issue of climate change. So preserving that biodiversity is uh, more difficult or impossible as a result of our changing climate. Or another example might be public health. You might think is the most important grand challenge. It's going to be really difficult to address because as the earth warms up, we're going to drive the chemical reactions faster that create ozone and far, fine particles. So for areas that have bad air pollution now, it's just going to get worse in the future, all things sort of remaining equal in terms of uh, the emissions level. Uh, but there's more. Uh, when you actually warm up the planet, we're, we're actually already seeing an increase in the spread of vector-borne disease. Uh, so uh, I was in India back in, God, the 1980s, and I got dengue fever and I lived through it. Uh, but I was in Canada. Actually, when I came back, and none of the doctors knew what to do with me because they had no idea what I had. But you either kind of die or you become immune to it. Uh, but those vector-borne diseases are spreading, and the one that you all know about here is Lyme tick disease. Uh, not, not only a result of changes in climate, but certainly a warmer climate is helping spread that disease uh, farther. You can also think about sort of the floods and the droughts that are going to actually impact uh, public health and then uh, more uh, and more we're seeing research coming out on the, uh, the mental impacts and the psychological impacts of living through major weather disasters. So it's going to be really difficult or impossible to actually address the improved public health as a result of climate change. So with that sort of as my introduction I want to share sort of three main points with you today. The first is that climate changes, it always has and always will. The only difference today is that there's an extensive and ever-growing body of scientific evidence that shows that humans are the main driver of that change. Right? The scientific community has proven this point beyond a shadow of a doubt over the course of the past three decades of research. I'm not going to talk a lot more about that. I'll talk a little bit about it. Happy to answer any questions. But once you realize that, once you truly internalize that, the following is true. The climate that our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren inherit depends fundamentally on the decisions we make really over the next decade or two on how we produce and how we use energy. The future climate is literally in our hands. And I'll show you what that means uh, at later on in the presentation. The second is that I think climate change is the innovation opportunity of the 21st century. We actually have to transition uh, away from fossil fuels and into renewable energy and energy efficiency and that's going to require a tremendous effort. And that's going to require lots of innovation. And if our country gets on board, and if the developing world gets on board, and the developed world gets on board, we can actually speed up this transition so it's much faster than the 50 to 60 to 70 years that historically it's taken to actually transition major energy supplies. But that's what we have to do. And actually, we've proven on the ground. We know what to do. Right now, the technology exists. It's the political will uh, that is lacking. So climate change is the innovation opportunity of the 21st century. Um, and then third, uh, 30 years of working on this, and I am quite sure that I said this the last time I was here, is climate change has become fundamentally a moral issue to me. And it is because it is those who are most vulnerable who are going to suffer the most. It is the young, it is the old, it is the poor, and it is the sick. And you just have to look at any of the big hurricanes that have hit to realize that's the case, or you just watch the television on what's going on in California right now. Right? If you're living in Malibu and your mansion catches on fire, you think you're living in your car? I don't think so. But those people in paradise who have no other place to live, right? you just heard them on NPR. And you know, my heart just goes out to them. It's just, it's, it is scorched earth. I mean, I, I have heard the word hell on earth more in the last week 
than I had in my entire lifetime. Uh, but it's crystal clear that it's those who are most vulnerable who are going to suffer the most. I, on the moral issue, I'd also add that when I drove down here tonight to be with you, I emitted some carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. I don't have my electric car yet. I'm waiting for my current Prius to die. I want a really good electric car, so every year I wait, that's better. Um, uh, but uh, that carbon dioxide is going to be warming the atmosphere for hundreds of years. So I get all the benefit today, but I am putting impact on future generations, and I also don't think that's uh, morally defensible. So those are the three points I want to leave you with tonight, and, and the rest is all really just details. Um, uh, by training, I'm an ice core paleoclimatologist, so I drill ice cores, I recover them, I bring them back to my lab, I cut them up, I analyze them, I figure out depth-age relationships, and I uh, actually work to reconstruct how climate has changed in the past. Over the last 20 years, I've become much more interested in sustainability and trying to figure out what New England does, but in my roots, I'm an ice core paleoclimatologist. I'm going to share one ice core record with you, and I do this every chance I get because it is the second most important environmental record that we have. This is not a record that I developed. This was a, it's, a, it's two records from two different ice cores in Antarctica. So they've been stitched together uh, from Antarctica, drilled by the Russians, analyzed by the French and the Americans at Vostok, and Dome C was done by the Japanese. So you see two records here, carbon dioxide concentration in blue and Antarctic temperature uh, in orange. And the bottom here is a time scale, and we're going back 800,000 years before present. So we've got an 800,000 year record. That uh, figure up in the upper left-hand corner is actually a cross-section of an ice core under cross-polar. Did you see the nice hexagonal crystals? And then those blobs are actually samples of the atmosphere that get trapped in the ice lattice, so it extends from fern to ice. So Antarctica is this perfect, uh, the, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet is this perfect system that preserves really old samples of the atmosphere for ice core glacial chemists to go back and recover and figure out what the trace gas content of the atmosphere was. So that's exactly what we've done. We take the ice, the deeper you go, farther back in time you get. Uh, you take the ice, you crush it, you extract that air, and you can measure the carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide of the atmosphere. And so you develop this carbon dioxide record going back over time. And so you've stared at this for a while, so I hope you get the sense that there's some really interesting aspects to this record. Uh, I'll also add that we melt the ice and we look at stable isotopes and that's how we get a proxy measurement for how the temperature at which the snow actually formed in the atmosphere. So there's a proxy record of temperature. And uh, so a few things. One is that there's these cycles where you have high carbon dioxide up around 300 parts per million by volume and low carbon dioxide down around 200 and 180 parts per million by volume. And you can see that there's been cycles that have happened sort of eight glacial cycles over the course of the last 800,000 years. So that's present, that's 18,000 years ago, right? Uh, uh, it was cold, uh, low carbon dioxide. That was a period of time in New England when there was nothing alive here. There were no Native Americans, there were no mosquitoes, there were no trees because it was covered by a mile of ice. And the remnants of that ice sheet is what we call Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard and any gravel pit that you see around this area. So there's been dramatic climate change uh, since that huge ice sheet actually retreated, really from about 18,000 to 10,000 years ago. Sea levels went up by 350 feet. Dramatic climate change over that time period. So you can see that that glacial interglacial cycle has happened eight times over the course of the last 800,000 years. You'll also notice that temperature and carbon dioxide concentration are actually in lockstep. Right? This was proof of the long understood uh, 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 physical aspects of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that were figured out more than a hundred years ago that when you have more greenhouse gas the temperature of the planet goes up because those, that greenhouse gas actually captures the long wave radiation coming from the earth. It is basic physics and here's the proof of those physics. More carbon dioxide, higher temperatures, lower carbon dioxide, low temperatures and you'll also note that carbon dioxide has never been higher than 300 parts per million over the course of the past 800,000 years. That's ice core evidence. We now have other evidence looking at different um, uh, chemistry and ocean sediments. It was 20 million years ago that we had greenhouse uh, carbon dioxide higher than 300 parts per million by volume. So let me just take that. I've, I've just sort of decreased the axes here because I want to show you what's happened over the course of the last 60 years or 55 years since we started monitoring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa, which Charles Keeling started. Uh, since 1957, 
up to today, right, we have increased the carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere from 315 to now 410 parts per million by volume. That is an amount that is equivalent to a shift that we see between a glacial age and an interglacial age. There's nothing more I need to tell you that, than to show you that human beings are dramatically changing the Earth's climate system, right? And we know that carbon dioxide came from the burning of fossil fuels. We took that carbon from the crust, we oxidize it, we get all the energy, that's, we, that's the benefit, uh, but the, the byproduct is carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. So that's about 80% of it. There's land use change and our agricultural systems are contributing to it as well. Now, if we're not careful, we're actually gonna end up where we're going. And if we continue to rely upon fossil fuels as our main source of energy, by 2100, we're gonna end up with carbon dioxide somewhere in the realm of 100 parts per million by volume. Maybe it's gonna be 1100, maybe it's gonna be 1200, maybe it's gonna be 800, but it's gonna be really high, and it's gonna result in catastrophic climate change, and I'm gonna show you what, uh, uh, exactly what I mean by that. Uh, conversely, if we invest in clean energy and energy efficiency, uh, we might be able to stabilize greenhouse uh, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere at around 450 to 500 parts per million. If you're really optimistic, and we act really quickly, and we figure out how to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, maybe we get back to 350 parts per million sometime towards the end of the century. But that's essentially the challenge. It's where we're going, business as usual, and where we need to be. And where we need to be is gonna require that transformation in our energy system. Uh, I just wanted to show a couple other seminal uh, environmental records. This is the Mauna Loa curve. So there's Charles Keeling. He, convinced his uh, graduate advisor to send him to Hawaii to do his research. Really smart guy. Uh, but he really figured out a, a very accurate way to measure carbon dioxide. So he started in the International Geophysical Year. You can see that red line up and down every year. That represents the inhalation and exhalation of the Northern Hemisphere biosphere. Right? So when we, our forests grow, we suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and then they drop the leaves and the bacteria respires and eats those leaves. So we have this annual cycle but you can see that long-term increase, right, is primarily the result of the burning of fossil fuels. Call that 80%, 20, 25% from our agricultural system. Uh, and then uh, this is a, a pretty classic image. I hope most of you have seen this. This is just surface temperature on the planet going back from 1880, now up through uh, 2017. So this is global land and ocean temperatures. And you can begin to see there's this real change in the 1970s when we just begin to have this monotonic increase in temperature uh, going forward. And 16 of the 17 warmest years have actually occurred in the 21st century, and the warm year before that was 1997, which was a big El Nino, right? There is no doubt that the planet is continuing to warm. One other record I wanna share with you is uh, the extent of Arctic sea ice. So it turns out that Arctic sea ice is really important for a number of reasons but from an Earth's energy balance is that it's white and it reflects incoming solar radiation. When you replace it with blue water, right, that water is dark, it absorbs solar radiation, it's actually the sun can shine into the ocean, so there's a much larger, there's a much bigger body, uh, mass that actually can absorb that energy, so you significantly change the energy balance when you go from white ice to dark blue water. And this was, the yellow line represents the sea ice average from 1979 to 2010. Then in 2012, we had a really, it was a really warm winter. We had this dramatic decline in the extent of Arctic sea ice. Um, if you look at that long term, so this is October sea ice, so minimum uh, sea ice extent occurs in September and October. Uh, so we've just passed that, but you can see this long term decline. The record starts in 1979, because that's when we started the satellites. Uh, that could actually uh, measure the ice. You can see there's year-to-year -year variability, but long-term decline almost on the order of 10% decrease in, in Arctic sea ice per decade. And we're on track to have that ice disappear sometime in the next uh, 10 to 20 to 30 years. Um, and what's happened is we've lost almost all of the multi-year sea ice. So now Arctic sea ice is really vulnerable to, uh, to really warm um, summers. So uh, one of the things, uh, one of the areas of research that has really progressed recently is our understanding of the contribution of big ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica uh, to sea level rise. So I want to take you through sort of a few images, uh, and this is relatively early on, so this is going to be the most taxing part of my presentation tonight. 
uh, but, but it's important. So I have one really crazy schematic slide and then it will be good from there. Uh, this is an image of Greenland taken with synthetic aperture radar, which illustrates the surface velocity of, glaci of, of the Greenland ice sheet. So how fast the ice is flowing in Greenland. So you see this key down here, the, the greens here represent on the order of one meter per year. When you get to the reds, you're looking at something on the order of 3,000 meters per year. So three kilometers per year, right? Big bodies of ice, like, like the ice sheet that would have been on, up on Mount, you know, way up north, but float over Mount Washington down the Merrimack River Valley. Huge bodies of ice. And you can see where it's flowing really fast on all those outlet glaciers. There's about 15 of them all around the outside of the Greenland ice sheet. So those are the big valleys that drain the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, uh, essentially what's happening is that the amount of ice that, that those outlet glaciers are dumping into the North Atlantic Ocean has increased dramatically, in some cases three to four times over the course of the past 20 years. So where they used to be 3,000 to 4,000 meters per year, this glacier in particular, Jakobshavn, is now uh, uh, moving at something on the order of 14 to 16,000 meters per year. So there's been this dramatic speed up in the rate of, um, uh, of ice being delivered to the North Atlantic. What I want to do, if I can remember how to do it, is actually just show you a short clip from a video that you should all see called Chasing Ice. I'm on the phone with Jim on one of our regular check-ins. Like Jim, it just, nothing's happening. Hey Jim, uh, it's going well. We had uh, some serious bouts of wind, but other than that, things are fairly well set up here. We've got some continuous time lapse going. It's starting, Adam, I think. Adam, it's starting. Oh wait, Jim, 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 this is the, the big piece is starting to cast. Let me call you back. Call him back. Okay, bye. Going? Yeah, in that V section right there. Holy shit, look at that big bird rolling. All four are running, right? Yeah. Look at that. You see how, look at the whole thing. is 300, sometimes 400 feet tall. Pieces of ice were shooting up out of the ocean 600 feet and then falling. The only way that you can really try to put it into scale with human reference is if you imagine Manhattan. And all of a sudden, all of those buildings just start to rumble and quake and peel off and just fall over and fall over and roll around. This whole massive city just breaking apart in front of your eyes. We're just observers. These two little dots on the side of the mountain. 
we watched and recorded the largest witness calving event ever caught on tape. So how big was this calving event that we just looked at? We'll resort to some illustrations again to give you a sense of scale. It's as if the entire lower tip of Manhattan broke off, except that the thickness, the height of it, is equivalent to buildings that are two and a half or three times higher than they are. That's a magical, miraculous, horrible, scary thing. I don't know that anybody's really seen the miracle and horror of that. It took 100 years for it to retreat eight miles from 1900 to 2000. From 2000 to 2010, it retreated nine miles. So in 10 years, it retreated more than it had in the previous 100. I think you would agree with me that is a distinctly non-linear process. <laughs> Uh, so uh, when we talk about the amount of how much sea level is going to rise over the course of the 21st century, it's really difficult to estimate because physicists are having a really hard time modeling that process, which you can understand. Because it is a, something passes a threshold and there is a catastrophic response. But that process that we saw there, and that I'll talk a little bit more about, is going on on these big outlet glaciers in Greenland and in West Antarctica. And so they are beginning to deteriorate much more rapidly than we've ever seen them deteriorate before. One of our big challenges is that we've never experienced this before. When the big ice sheet disintegrated, there weren't a bunch of scientists and satellites around to track it. So uh, we're really entering into um, unknown territory. Uh, but what, do, what does this mean? So you can see here, this is Antarctica, and here this is uh, ice loss. You can see the darker colors, more ice loss, so you can see lots of ice loss on the, uh, 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 in the part of West Antarctica here. On the average, uh, Antarctica is losing 125 gigatons of ice per year. All right, how much is a gigaton? It's a billion tons. Does that help? <laughs> Do you know how much a billion tons of ice is? It's equivalent to about 400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Or if you took a block of ice and you in, on the National Mall in Washington and you went from the capital to the Lincoln Memorial, the whole width, it would be four times higher than the Washington Monument. One gigaton of ice. So from Antarctica right now, we're losing on the average of 125 gigatons per year. Right? So there's a, negative, there's a negative mass balance. This land ice is moving from the land into the ocean, which means it's rising sea levels. So Greenland is disintegrating about twice as fast as West Antarctica. It's contributing 281 gigatons per year. You know, more or less, give or take 10 or 20 gigatons. This is the best estimate from uh, the GRACE satellite, which is measuring the change in gravity as these ice sheets uh, lose their mass. And you can see, right, big loss around Jakob Sabin, uh, up north, down in the south. Um, significant amounts of ice. So both uh, Greenland and Antarctica together are contributing about a one millimeter of sea level rise per year at the current rates, and we expect that that's going to increase in the future. Um, so uh, this is a difficult diagram that I told you about, uh, but it's, it's actually really important for, I think, for you to understand this. But I'm a glaciologist, so maybe I'm just weird and think this is really cool. But this comes from a really uh, a, a seminal paper now uh, that Dave Pollard and Rob DeConto uh, published in Nature, where they have gone in and really tried to model the physics of this ice shelf disintegration. So if you just look on top, we're talking about marine ice shelf instability in that figure marked A up there. Hopefully you can see the black lines that outline, right, this big ice shelf that goes out over the ocean. And it's on that brown line, which is the bed. And you'll notice there's this thing, re re reverse slope bed. That turns out to be really important for the vulnerability of these ice sheets. So especially in West Antarctica and in some areas in Greenland, when you go in, into the ice sheet, it's actually grounded on land that is underwater. All right, that's that reverse slope. So that's going to be really important. So you've got the, that ice flux right, coming out. And what the ice shelf does 
is it buttresses the ice sheet. It's this huge mass that keeps the ice sheet from flowing out into the ocean. So think about it like a wine bottle uh, on its side with a cork in it. The ice shelf is the cork that keeps the wine from flowing out. So the ice shelf does the same thing. So when the ice shelf retreats for any reason, more ice is going to flow out into the ocean. So what's happening is we have this cold water on the surface because the, the, gla the glacier is melting, but this warmer deep water is coming up and melting the underside of these ice sheets, causing them those, those big calving events to happen and causing them to come back. And you'll notice when you get down here that the grounding line right, has moved inland from up there. And so as the grounding line moves in, there's this, I'm going to take you back to like grade seven math here. There's that little letter H, right? That's that H represents the size of that ice cliff. So, you know, they said a few hundred feet in that last video. As you begin to melt this back, what happens is that height of the ice cliff gets bigger and bigger. And once that ice cliff is more than a few hundred feet, it is a fundamentally unstable system and you enter into a vicious cycle of it's not able to support itself because it's vertical ice and it just starts collapsing. And what we don't know is how fast that can actually happen. So that's marine ice shelf. What these guys did, Pollard and Nakanto, was actually figured out how to model it, this marine ice cliff instability. So they added some other stuff. We're actually melting these ice sheets from the top because it's a warmer atmosphere and there's more rain and there's hydro fracturing. There's lots of calving. That's what they began to model is that unstable ice cliff. And so uh, they, the results of their paper was that we can expect, well, I shouldn't say expect, it is possible that these ice shelves will retreat much more quickly than we even see them retreating today because of this reverse slope. As you melt more, you get steeper ice cliffs. It becomes a more unstable system. The ice falls off. The ice cliffs get steeper. steeper. It's a vicious cycle. And that's why we're not great right now at predicting how much these ice shelves are going to contribute to sea level rise by a certain period of time. So that's some uncertainty. Let me give you some certainty to finish this part of uh, my lecture, is that there is no uncertainty that sea levels are rising today and they are going to continue to rise for centuries. The only uncertainty is how much by when. So, you know, you might, if, if you're, if you're willing to accept risk, maybe, you know, two feet, three feet, four feet, six feet by 2100 is okay, but it's going to get there. It's going to get to eight feet. And the glaciologists that are working on this, given what they've seen in Greenland and West Antarctica, suggest that it's probably inevitable that 20 to 40 feet of sea level rise occurs when Greenland and West Antarctica uh, uh, sort of continue to disintegrate. Uh, that's hundreds of years, but it's going to happen. And I would argue it's probably time to start thinking about where we put our future infrastructure. Uh, we shouldn't assume that it's going to be okay to put it where we've put infrastructure over the course of the past hundred years. So uh, thermal expansion, so as water warms up, it's going to uh, be less dense, it's going to take up more volume. We know that, that the ocean has actually absorbed 90% of the excess heat added to the Earth's system as a result of the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Most of that energy has gone in the ocean and it's starting to raise the ocean. The added water coming from melting ice caps and glaciers is almost twice as much. And you can see the beginning of an exponential rise in that, right? So the future concern with sea level rise is really about how much ice is going to get dumped into those oceans, how quickly. All right. With all that said, uh, uh, this is a, a, a figure from uh, the last uh, climate science special report. If you really want to know about the science of climate change, this is a great place to start. But so scientists around the U.S. get together, sort of there's been, there were hundreds of them, and they review all the peer-reviewed literature, and they come up with the best assessment of climate change. And so I always get this question from people who uh, might deny the science around climate change. It says, well, climate's always changed, which I agree with, and it's the sun, or it's volcanoes, or it's because of land use change. But we have looked at all of those aspects, and we now know that in terms of the amount of warming, which we measure in watts per meter squared, that human causes, we're not just increasing the temperature from greenhouse gases, we're cooling it because we're putting aerosols in it, we're changing the ozone layer, but human causes are the main source of the warming that we've seen really over the course of the past 250 years, but really significantly over the course of the past 60 years, 
right, is driven primarily by human uh, effects. You cannot explain it by an increase in solar activity or a decrease in volcanic activity. Five things I would love you to leave with tonight. Uh, uh, this is like climate scientist shorthand. 30 years of research, we want to communicate with the public better. Here's what you have, right? It's real, it's us, scientists agree, it's bad, we can fix it. Um, I just want to uh, share a, a few sort of more regional aspects of climate change. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but we've written a whole bunch of reports for New Hampshire, and so you can just apply those to Newburyport. We're in the process of working on a new New England climate assessment using the national climate assessment models. I'll show you a few of those results, uh, but I said this at the beginning, right? It's getting warmer and wetter. It's going to continue to get warmer and wetter in the future. Uh, the big thing, though, is that we're getting more of our rain in fewer events. Is there anybody who would disagree with me based on your personal observations of precipitation patterns over the course of the past three decades? Right? It's like we get the deluge. Like this past week has been a, a wonderful example. But Durham, New Hampshire, where UNH is, is sort of the poster child for this. The number of precipitation events that dropped more of four inches of rain in 48 hours. In 1963 to 1972, we got one. And then in the decade from 2003 to 2012, we got 10, right? A climatologist coming and speaking to you five years ago saying, we're going to have a precipitation event that drops 50 inches of rain in the United States would have been laughed out of the room, but that's exactly what happened in Hurricane Harvey, right? A warm atmosphere is able to hold much more moisture. And as a result, when we have these precipitation events, we have much bigger precipitation events. So it's going to get wetter in the future. That's good. We'll have fresh water. That's going to be important in a world uh, where there's going to be lots of drought, but we're going to have to figure out how to manage that water because it's going to be coming in bigger deluges. So how is it that we go about storing uh, that water? I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, this is just some great research I wanted to share with you from Larry Hamilton, who's a sociologist at UNH. We do, uh, he does a lot of different surveying across New Hampshire when he participates in national surveys. But there's some hope in this uh, respect, right? Percentage agreeing that climate change is happening now caused mainly by human activities. And you can see the green is for New Hampshire residents. Uh, the black uh, are really representative of more national surveys. But we're getting up towards 65 to 70 percent. You could even argue in this election cycle that there may have been some candidates that were elected primarily because of their stance on the issue of climate change. There was a really big <coughs> ad in Maine that's talking about uh, the warming Gulf of Maine, which is the body of water that is warming the most out of any body of water in the world. Uh, and that's going to have serious impacts for our lobster industry, which is now, you know, billion billion plus dollars of revenue. Um, so uh, there's some hope in that respect. I want to share a little bit of language from the IPCC report. So international, sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change comes out with a global climate assessment every uh, five or six years. Right? The second one, they had there was more convincing evidence. 2001, they said it was likely. 2007, very likely. 2013, it is now extremely likely that more than half of the warming is due to human activities. Right? Very likely, meaning we are 99% sure that that is the case. So one of the things that the IPCC does is try to answer that question of what's climate going to be like in the future. And so I started off by saying the future climate is literally in our hands. So this is a visual de demonstration of that uh, statement. So we don't know what human beings are going to do in the future. We don't know what our economic system is going to be like. Uh, so instead of trying to predict, what scientists have done is develop scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. And then we use those scenarios to drive these tools we have called global climate models to model how the temperature or the precipitation patterns might change based on how much greenhouse gas there is in the atmosphere. So these are the greenhouse gas emission scenarios. You can see there's a whole bunch of them. And us scientists, we love to confuse people. So we've called them RCPs, which is representat representative concentration pathways leading to 8.5 watts per meter squared of warming. And this one is 4.5 watts per meter squared warming. I show you those because that's when, when I show you the results for New England, uh, we, we have run those two scenarios in our downscaled models. You can see that. RCP 4.5 uh, uh, results in sort of a, on the order of a 4 degrees Fahrenheit warming, and RCP 8.5 results in 8 degrees uh, Fahrenheit warming, right? So if you think in Celsius, right, that's close to 1.5 to 2, and the 8 is more like 4.5 degrees warming. So then what we do is, uh, uh, we didn't do this, actually, this was done out in San Diego uh, at Scripps, but we take these big grid cells, uh, they took these big grid cells, 
and they downscaled them to much finer resolution. So 29 different global climate models using this particular statistical downscaling technique, which works really well, particularly for extreme events. And here's what it means. What's our temperature going to be in the future? Well, it depends on how much greenhouse gas we put in the atmosphere. The future climate is literally in our hands. Under RCP 4.5, we'd expect modest, right? We're, we're changing atmospheric temperature in degrees centigrade. Uh, early 2010 to 2039, right? Modest warming. Mid, late century, under an RCP 4.5 degree warming, we'd expect something on the order of three to three and a half degrees centigrade warming, which puts us sort of like a summertime climate like Washington, D.C. It's pretty significant change, right? Significant reduction in snow cover, uh, probably loss of a lot of our winter recreation, significant changes in our ecosystem. Under RCP 8.5, this is a scenario where we continue to rely upon fossil fuels for our main source of energy. We're looking at, right, pretty homogeneous increase in temperature of six to seven degrees centigrade, which puts our summertime climate currently uh, like it is in, uh, so in North Carolina, right? Dramatic change in uh, the way we interact with our outdoor environment. So what does that mean? So you can look at one, one measure of many we've done is how many days are there going to be that are warmer than 90 degrees Fahrenheit? Under the high emission scenario, we have a lot more hot days, like on the order, <laughs> uh, like on the order of 100 days that are over 90 degrees warm. That's, that, that's the dark red. So leading up sort of into Boston, uh, down here, some oranges are more around the 80 range, right up from the 10 that we experience today. So think about the summer is essentially a heat wave and we all live indoors in air conditioning to stay cool. So a future climate, annual precipitation, you can see under either scenario, it's going to get wetter, right? This is the change in annual precipitation. 25 millimeters is about an inch if you have to, uh, so right, we're up to, the dark blue is up to 10 inches change. So we get about 45 inches of rain per year on the coast. So a 10 inch change, right, is a, about a 25% change. So we'll get slightly more rain or we'll get a lot more rain. But again, it's going to become, it's going to come in, uh, more rain is going to come in fewer events. So if I just go back to this one, we can change uh, March, April, May. So when do we have our, our big floods, right? They're usually in the fall if we have a really big hurricane, or they're in the spring during snowmelt period, or if worse comes to worse, we have a really big nor'easter that's all rain in winter. Uh, and then we get coastal flooding whether or, or not it's rain. But you can see under RCP 8.5, we get a lot more rain in that season. Right, so that's something we're going to have to begin to prepare for. All right, and then we're going to continue to have uh, sea level rise. This actually comes from a, a figure that was in our um, New Hampshire Coastal Risks and Hazards Commission report, but this comes right from the 2014 National Climate Assessment. And uh, the notion here is that here's how uh, sea level has risen over the course of the past hundred years. That's the straight line interpolation, but we know that that curve is beginning to bend upwards. So there's an intermediate low sea level rise scenario of 1.6 feet, and there's a high sea level rise at 6.6 .6 feet. And our recommendation for the Coastal Risk and Hazards Commission was that where, if you, where you have little tolerance for risk, which means you're thinking about a wastewater treatment plant, a school, a police station, a fire department, Route 1, a bridge, you better uh, plan for four, for four feet and be prepared to deal with 6.6 .6 feet. That's what it says down here just off the, off the screen. So we, we provided a risk-based uh, guidance to the commission, right? If you have an oyster shack on the beach, doesn't matter. You're going to lose it. But for that infrastructure that's critical for your society to operate, you better start thinking about this. The most recent national climate assessment that came out, that climate science special report in 2017, has now added one additional scenario. They've put the RCPs on here, 2.4, 4.5, 8.5. Mm -hmm. The warmer it gets, the more that we can expect sea level to rise. But again, right, we're not very good at modeling those big glaciers, those big ice sheets that are disintegrating now. So this is based on, to a large extent, on expert judgment, what could happen. But three years later, there's now an eight feet of sea level rise by 2100. So that's the new guidance is suggesting that by the end of the century, you might want to start thinking about being prepared for eight feet. Does, am I saying that's going to happen? I don't know. What I'm saying is that that's possible. The best scientists who work on this are saying that that's possible. And I'll go back to what I said previously about certainty. At some point, we're going to have eight feet of sea level rise. Maybe it's not by 2100. Maybe it's by 2050. Maybe it's by 2200. 
But sea level, we have started the change in this system and we're not going back. There is too much warmth in the system to turn this around right now. We've kind of crossed a, a tipping point and we have to start accepting that and dealing with it. I do want to come back uh, to this notion uh, because Sheila did want me to talk about the hopeful part and I'll get there. <laughs> Um, I've, I've talked longer than I wanted to. Um, uh, one of the things uh, that, uh, so I was part of the New Hampshire Coastal Risk and Hazards Commission and we had some very conservative lawmakers and scientists uh, on the team. And uh, we met for three years and we came up with 35 recommendations and we all accepted them unanimously. And so in this era of partisan divide, right, the question is how is it that you can get this group of coastal citizens to come together and actually make these decisions? So if you want to learn more about that, you can read about it in this article that I wrote in the conversation. But I would say one of the most important things that we can do now is uh, not get so involved in the science of climate change because that is divisive for people with different political ideologies. Right? If you're conservative and Republican, you don't believe the science. If you're liberal and Democrat, you do believe the science. But what I think we need to do, and what I saw as part of this effort, is that if we can get beyond that, actually, solutions, uh, because in part, right, it's the innovation opportunity of the 21st century, that we can actually agree that, sure, we want cleaner air. Sure, we want clean water. Sure, we want clean, abundant energy. And of course, we want jobs. Of course we want our economy to grow and actually the solutions line up. And so what I've found is that when I can jump to solutions and talk about sort of our shared values in terms of, for example, preserving this beautiful seacoast that we have, that I can engage far more people as opposed to trying to beat them down and saying, I know the science better than you do or you don't understand the science. There is a political divide on the science that we have to get beyond. And I think talking about solutions is one way to do it. And frankly, taking the time to listen to their concerns, to their concerns, to the concerns on all sides, uh, which is what I did when I sat and listened to conservative Republicans express their concerns about this issue. I didn't yell at them. We just sat at the table and talked and they listened to me. And over the course of time, we actually made significant progress. It's hard to imagine moving forward with just 50% or 60% of the population on board with this issue. Um, all right, uh, maybe I'll finish up with just three slides and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, if you haven't heard about this report, this is really important. This is a very different way that the IPCC is messaging about the issue of climate change. So what island nations around the world have done in response to the treaty that was signed in Paris was say, what's the difference between a global warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade and global warming of 2.5 degrees centigrade. And I should just add at the beginning, we're headed under business as usual to 3.5 degrees centigrade warming, right? So we're looking at like, we're really slicing hairs when there's a way bigger problem out there. But I, this, this report really illustrates the difference. Um, and uh, in, in sort of, in terms of island nations, 1.5 and 2 degrees is the difference between them surviving maybe surviving and then disappearing because sea level rise comes up and wipes out their island nations. Uh, but if you look at Arctic sea ice, at what, if we can keep warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is going to be a huge challenge, right? It remains during most summers. At 2 degrees centigrade, ice-free summer summers are 10 times more likely, right? Extreme heat, 14% of humans suffer extreme heat. And I'm not talking about days that are hotter than 90 degrees. I'm talking about extreme heat where tens of thousands of people die, like in the big heat wave in uh, Europe about a decade ago. Under two degrees centigrade, 37% of humans on the planet experience extreme heat. Most of them in the tropics, most of them that don't have energy, and therefore most of them that don't have air conditioning. Water scarcity, sort of it's bad in either scenario. Uh, on the biodiversity front, plants and animals losing more than 50% of your range. You can see the numbers under the 1.5 degree centigrade more than double under the 2 degree centigrade uh, warming. Uh, coral reefs, I mean, it's just not a good scenario for coral reefs. We're going to have very frequent mass mortality. It's beginning to happen already. Uh, and, and that's going to continue. And then under two degrees, essentially coral reefs disappear. And you may be upset because your grandkids don't get to swim on them, but they are uh, the nursery for most of the fish in the tropical ocean. Uh, population directly exposed to sea level rise. 
so it goes up by just a few tens of millions of people. And global co crop yield, there's also, it's already low under 1.5. It's going to be even lower under a 2 degree centigrade warming. So there's a big difference. You know, people say, ah, it's only a small number, 0.5 degrees centigrade. Temperature change today was much larger than that. It's a different number. It's a global average temperature and half a degree centigrade, a degree Fahrenheit makes a really big difference. And again, we're headed to 3.5. Uh, we talk in terms, in the, in the climate community, we talk about two solutions, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation is reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and adaptation is essentially adapting to the change that we've already committed to. So you can read my list here, but I am going to start by saying, because I know somebody's going to ask me this question anyway, it's like, what can I really do? How can I make a difference? So I'm going to say something different that you probably haven't heard before. I want you all to interrogate your investments. Whatever investments you have, if your investments, if the only reason you have your money invested is to make money and you don't care what it's invested in, you're not investing in the future that you want. You might think like just getting that six or eight or 10% interest rate is sufficient. I would argue it's not. If you have money invested in the stock market, big investments, you should be asking it to do two things. You should be asking for a reasonable rate of return, right? five to seven to 10%, maybe some of you are better than that, but you should be investing in the future that you want. We are gonna need close to a trillion dollars per year for 30 years to transition our current energy system to one that is renewable, and where is that money gonna come from? We now have about 300 billion of that. The rest of that money has to come from somewhere, and a lot of it can actually come from us in our retirement funds if we invest in the future we want. The University of New Hampshire, pretty conservative group of people on, uh, on our endowment and we have a pretty tiny endowment compared to a lot of the Ivy League schools. Uh, but we have recently transitioned about 20% of our investment into ESG, Environment, Social and Governance Funds, which essentially looks at the best in class in those three realms. And our ESG funds are now returning a better rate of return by a point or two over our traditional investments. We're going to continue working with the university to get 100% of those investments in ESG, but there are major foundations around the world that are doing this. Norway has now taken its sovereign trust, a trillion dollars that it got primarily from selling fossil, drilling and selling fossil fuel to Europe, and they are no longer di uh, investing in fossil fuels. One of the most important things you can do is free up the money and invest in the future that you really want. It's going to take people like us investing in it because the Exxon Mobiles of the world are not. So why don't I stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, we stopped in 1963 and I, I actually know that intimately because we use that atmospheric nuclear weapons testing layer in glaciers to actually help date our ice cores. And we don't see like the radioactivity. There's this huge spike in 1963. We got all the testing done, the US, the USSR the, and Britain. Uh, then the test ban treaty was signed. So all the atmospheric nu nuclear, all the nuclear weapons testing now happens underground. So it's not a big issue for climate. Uh, volcanoes, when they erupt and they're really big, they can lower temperature you know, up to a degree centigrade for several years. So they have a significant short-term impact, but they don't really have a long-term impact. And the carbon dioxide that comes from volcanoes is minuscule uh, compared to what human uh, beings are generating. Yes, sir. So I, I think you might be mixing up a couple of things here, but let me, let me try to answer your question. So uh, yeah, ice cores drilled throughout the northern hemisphere have showed this rapid increase in uh, sulfate aerosols that came from the burning of fuel that had sulfur in it, so coal and oil. So you burn it, you oxidize the carbon, you also all oxidize the sulfur, you get sulfur dioxide and that goes through a chemical reaction that forms an aerosol, that's a sulfate particle, fine particle, uh, and that, when it's in the atmosphere, that serves to reflect incoming solar radiation. So the same reason volcanoes cool climate, when we burn fossil fuels and those aerosols are in uh, the lower atmosphere, they serve to cool climate. So we saw, we've seen the rise of those sulfate aerosols throughout the Northern Hemisphere. And then um, uh, with sort of passage of the Clean Air Act in the US and then similar uh, regulations in Europe, we've begun to see a decline. But China's right in India are still pumping out lots of sulfur dioxide. So we can see those, those trends. Um, uh, sulfate on the snow isn't going to have a lot of impact, but when there's another uh, particulate that's called black carbon, so when you're about stuck behind that big truck 
and they start up and all that black stuff comes out, so that's black carbon. That's another really important aerosol. And that uh, serves, we think that serves to help increase the rate of melting. But the biggest impact actually we think is that it's heating the lower atmosphere. So those particles are black. When they're in the atmosphere, they absorb solar radiation, they heat up the atmosphere. We're not seeing a huge impact on the Greenland ice sheet. I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but there's been a lot of research on that. And so I'd say the jury is out. I don't think we've figured that out completely. Uh, but it's certainly a concern. Yes, sir. Um, could you talk a little bit about number four? Uh, transition to a lower carbon food system. Sure. So uh, currently, uh, our agricultural system, you know, th this number is hard to pin down, but I say 20, 20, 25 percent. Some people would argue as much as 50 percent of the greenhouse gases are coming from our agricultural system. So primarily, that's in the form of methane. That is being uh, that comes from cows as they di as they, they digest the grass that they eat. Um, uh, so uh, lots of methane produced by cows, but also because we're putting a tremendous amount of energy into the fertilizer that we put into the ground, and then all the machinery uh, to grow those crops, um, uh, fertilizer, and then and then the fertilizer also decomposes, and you get nitrous oxide. So methane and nitrous oxide from agricultural systems. Uh, so tr a tr so. A lot of it comes from, uh, from creating, from sort of growing corn, right? And growing soybeans and growing meat. And so the notion of a transition to a lower carbon food system is really one where we eat a much more varied diet, right? Many more vegetables, many more fruits and less meat. So I'm not the guy that's going to say go vegan because I like to eat meat, but I've significantly changed my diet, so I eat, eat much less meat. We're now seeing sort of globally that the, the trend is in the completely opposite direction with uh, sort of very populous nations with China at the front really wanting and demanding a lot more red meat, and that's particularly a concern. But there's lots that we can do to change it in this country. So, so I, I don't think there's a lot of Pacific water that can make it into the Arctic just because it all has to go through the Bering Straits. So it's really, it's this big North Atlantic system where you have the Gulf Stream flowing north um, uh, that, that transfers there's a tremendous amount of heat with it. And it's why sort of Europe is warmer and Russia has those big ports that are open all winter. Um, so uh, if, if anything, the science suggests that the strength of that current has actually declined over time. And the reason is because the North Atlantic has cold, salty water that sinks and sort of forms this conveyor belt. It sinks and goes down eventually over the Pacific and then the return flow is the Gulf Stream. So when you lower the amount of cold salty water that's sinking, you lower the amount of heat that can be transported northwards with the Gulf Stream. And so if you look at a map of global temperature increases, you'll actually see that the area around Iceland is cooling and the reason is because there's less energy being transported with the Gulf Stream. So I think without having read the paper, but just putting those pieces together is you can't really explain Arctic sea ice decline from an increase in the ocean heat flux to the Arctic Ocean. It's really sort of a result of that, of that, of warmer temperatures driving the melting of the sea ice. So, uh, so again, I'll just argue, we don't do predictions, we do projections. What you see on the weather channel, on the weather news, right? They run a whole bunch of models and they get probabilities and they do predict predictions. So we do scenarios. So we pick a scenario and then we run a bunch of models, but you can't put a probability on a scenario, right? So what's the probability that we're actually going to turn this system around and all be on renewables? It's like hard to mathematically determine. We can all hope one way or the other. So uh, projections. So we have uh, projected that uh, even though we're going to get more precipitation, uh, the model, I didn't show this to you, but we don't seem to be getting a lot more precipitation in summertime. Summertime precipitation stays reasonably flat or maybe goes up a little bit, but with really much higher temperatures, we see a lot more evapotranspiration. So drought in the future, we don't think is being driven by a lack of precipitation, but by way more evaporation. So loss of the system and drought sort of defined by changes in soil moisture. So uh, we've projected that there'll be a significant increase in short term drought. So summertime drought. But in terms of long term drought, we're not going to face what the West is facing. So uh, we're not used to drought. Uh, but I think it's something that we'll be able to, uh, to address. But again, we have to start thinking about what we do with that water when it comes down in a huge deluge. How do we actually conserve that water so we can use it later? Anybody here from Citizens Climate Lobby? One person. So you have somebody to talk to, right? You've, you've identified your job for the <laughs> evening. 
All right, so here you go, carbon fee and dividend. So I don't talk to uh, uh, the, the politicians. I, I say that we have to put a price on carbon. It's really important. I really support what the Citizens Climate Lobby is doing. If you're not a member, you should join because they have a really well thought out plan and they are really good at talking to their representatives about it. I go down and talk to them about my expertise, which is climate change. So this is like a polit this is a policy. It's not a climate science thing. So, but in my opinion, this is a really good idea. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, I have a weird accent. I'm from Canada. The Canadian government has just passed this. Essentially, it's this plan that they have just adopted. And it's really interesting because provinces have lots of power and some are on board and some aren't, but they are going full steam ahead. So the notion is you, you put a price. The reason it's so variable is that it's really hard to estimate the externalities. So what's the cost of India not being able to grow enough food because of climate change, right? So it's really hard to price that in. You can, you, people do it very narrowly and just say, no, we're looking at the very narrow. Some people do it broadly. So that's the big range. But the citizens climate lobby is you, you just start with something, but what you have to do is ratchet it up. So whether or not you're getting the number right doesn't matter. What you're doing is you're sending a signal to the marketplace so that renewables cost less, so that when big companies, big investment firms, your IRA, right, is invested in renewable energy instead of fossil fuels. And this is the argument we've made at UNH, right? Investing in fossil fuels is risky. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but likely they're not going to be around. Um, what I really like about the citizens climate lobby approach is that uh, there's no increase in the size of government. That money gets turned around and gets sent right back to everybody as a dividend, a monthly paycheck, basically, to everybody in the country. It's exactly what they're doing in Canada. And they think that's going to sell the program because when people start getting a check for something on the order of $250 a month from the federal government in Canada. And then how you deal with this is interesting. Canada's not doing this exactly, but you can't just let people import cheap goods and go on putting carbon in the atmosphere. You have to have some sort of border adjustment. And what Canada's doing is they're not going to require those big carbon intensive industries to pay the tax, which I don't know. I don't agree with so much, but at least they're making progress on it. So this is what the citizens climate lobby is doing. And they're distinctly and on purpose nonpartisan and they're really good at engaging their politicians, so I'd encourage you. How's that for a plug? <laughs> yes, sir. What's the main argument that the climate deniers are using to further their arguments on climate change? Um, God, how much time do you have? So it, it's, there's, there is such a range, uh, and they just tend to be really shallow. So let me answer your question a, a different way is I think at the underpinnings at the root of this is that they're, they're first of all, they're not skeptics. I'm a scientist. I'm a skeptic. So-called climate skeptics are only skeptical of science that doesn't uh, support their predetermined ideology. So they're not skeptical at all. Um, so I think what happens is they have an ideology, conservative ideology that uh, uh, to, to be very short about it is about smaller government. Smaller government is better. And there's an argument to be had for smaller government versus bigger government. It's an argument that we have constantly in this country. But once you accept smaller government and then somebody says, oh, well, there's this big global problem and we need to get people involved, they immediately take this leap of faith. Well, then that means bigger government, which means I'm against it. So now you have the ideology mapped out and then they will grab at anything that supports their ideology. So this is, I mean, psychologists and sociologists have worked on this, right? They, they are just, they're, they're biased assimilation of information. And so they will grasp at anything. And given that there is a, a uh, there are big wealthy companies that stand to lose if we burn less fossil fuel, right? There has been a tremendous amount of support in the denialist machine. So there's many, many different arguments. And what's interesting is when I really sit down and talk to, to uh, people that deny the science of climate change is you get to a point when I'm trying to explain something and they just stop and come up with the next argument and the next argument and the next argument, right? It's just a series of arguments to slow down progress. So my suggestion is just talk, just try to talk to them about shared values. Do you care about your children? What about clean air? How about the fact that solar now employs, solar alone employs twice as many people as there are in the entire fossil fuel industry in this country? Like, just work to the solutions. If you're not a climate scientist, like, 
I've been, I've been criticized for this, but I don't think non-climate scientists should really be trying to teach other people about the science of climate change. It's pretty settled. It's not, there's lots more to do, but in terms of human influence on the climate system, it's very clear. Just, hey, just go look at the National Climate Assessment. Yes, sir. I better ask a woman soon. I'm going to be... A, you two next. So, uh, um, first of all, ecosystems have this really cool thing. It's called photosynthesis. It's better than anything humans have ever come up with, and we should be maximizing it. And then the other piece is, really, we can be burying probably about 25% of the carbon that humans emit into the atmosphere in our soil with better farming practices. So it's not just trees, it's also changing the farming practices, raising the fertility of that soil, making them better at growing the food that we need, and storing more carbon, and, and we can do that. So, um, uh, like, that's the best carbon sink. Uh, there's no way that we get to 1.5 degrees centigrade or even 2 degrees centigrade without figuring out some kind of mechanical way of taking carbon dioxide uh, out of the atmosphere. And I am, I am really not hopeful on the big geoengineering uh, perspectives because they are just not cost effective. Um, uh, the, the, the best ones are really enhancing the natural system. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, you can now invest in companies that actually dump iron into the southern ocean to enhance phytoplankton to grow more quickly because they're iron limited to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But it's just way easier to grow a tree in your yard than it is to carry liquid iron out down to the southern ocean. So I am, I'd like to see us do as much as we can in terrestrial ecosystems. I think it's a much better uh, way to do it and cost effective. Yes. I'm dying to know how long an ice core is to go back 800,000 years. So it's about a mile. So the, the Greenland ice sheet, more than a mile, the, Greenland, the, the Antarctic ice sheet is about 10,000 feet thick. So close to a mile, 1.7 miles. So it's, it's drilling ice core, yeah, it's, 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 it's best when it's really, really boring, which means you're just bringing up five meters of core at a time and everything goes really well. It's an incredible logistical uh, challenge. Uh, so, I, I wish I knew why it was happening. Uh, so, we know it's happening because of the measurements. Um, and and uh, the, the oceanographers that I've talked to in the papers I've read suggest that it really has to do with some change in ocean circulation. So, maybe the amount of cold Labrador current that comes back around Nova Scotia is getting into the Gulf of Maine has been uh, somehow, has slowed somehow because of changes, uh, dynamic changes in the Gulf Stream. Um, so, I don't know a lot more than that. We don't know. Um, I, it, it's, it's definitely happening on the surface, because so, so this is really out of the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, Andrew Pershing and his colleagues, and a lot of those measurements are now from satellite images. So it's not uh, clear uh, how far down that warming extends into uh, the Gulf of Maine. But there is a link between the warming waters in the Gulf of Maine and the incredible increase in the, in the landings of lobsters in Maine, right? So the warming has really, there's very little commercial lobster industry left in the um, Long Island Sound, Rhode Island. Uh, I don't know about off here, but I know the, the, the lobstermen up in Portsmouth are beginning to see paralytic shellfish disease, right? And so like the lobsters have gone north to the Gulf of Maine. And now the fear is with like another two degrees centigrade warming, which is a huge amount of warming, is that they would just continue to go up to Canada. Uh, the, other, the other impact that you probably all know about here is that, uh, you know, the commercial codfish industry is now essentially gone, right? What, what Massachusetts was founded on, uh, right, is just no longer viable. And when we did our research back in 2006, we suggested that, that the commercial cod industry would begin to disappear at the end of the century. And it's happened much more rapidly because juvenile cod need cold waters. And so without that cold water, you just don't have those juvenile cod. So, uh, so this is definitely where I, I'm going to give you my opinion. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not big on nuclear energy. I've been hearing about the promise of smaller, completely safe nuclear energy power plants for a long time. People from the energy industry always come up and talk to me after my presentations, and I haven't seen them yet. So what I see of big nuclear is that it cannot compete on a cost. It's too expensive. And by the way, who pays insurance for big nuclear power plants? We do. Because if there's a disaster, so the nuclear power plant doesn't have to carry insurance on a major disaster because 
the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Committee and our tax dollars are going to take care of it. So if you can't pay your insurance, that's kind of one way to think about bankruptcy. Um, you know, the big power plant down in Georgia that Westinghouse was built is now <coughs> offline. So until the promised new technology comes online, I just don't see it as a viable economic solution compared to solar and wind that now cost less than coal and oil and in many cases natural gas, sort of proven technologies. The big thing we have to figure out is the battery. How do we store that intermittent energy source? So, um, you know, there's a lot of controversy right now with the Clean Energy Power Connect that Massachusetts wants from Quebec hydropower that's going to come down through Maine. Uh, you know, there's lots of environmental groups that are against it. It's going to have impact, but I see those hydro plants as our battery for New England. We can, we're going to have utility scale batteries here, but we need a big battery for all the solar and wind that we do. So we have to figure that out. And that's what nuclear, right, base load is what it's good for. But it's just not cost effective and there's considerable liability associated with it. So I'm not big on it. The only way that I know that you can make a coal plant low or net zero is by taking the carbon dioxide out of the flue gases and putting it somewhere. And that somewhere tends to be in geological formation. So, so right now, uh, both in Texas and in Norway, they take that carbon dioxide and they pump it into the ground to enhance their oil recovery. So, uh, that's, so, so that's called a form of geoengineering, right? Sucking carbon. So you can suck it out of the atmosphere or you can suck it out of a flue gas. The challenge is it's really expensive. And if we wanted to, so, so compared to sort of better farming practices, if we wanted to suck all the carbon out of all the fossil fuel plants in the United States, it would take infrastructure that's comparable to the interstate system. So given that we can't even fix our rusted bridges, I think it's not a place where I would be investing my money. So technically, yes. Practically, no. I, I'm not an oil driller, so I don't know completely, but they're using the carbon dioxide to enhance recovery. But what we, can, what we could do is we could pump it in there and then cap those wells. And right, they're deep enough and they're cased, so that is a sealed system. And then we do kind of cross our fingers and say, like, I hope there's no big earthquake or new cracks. That Good idea. Yeah, so, so I would say when we use the term global warming, it's the, it's the enhanced warming beyond the warming from the ice age. So absolutely, there's those natural cycles. And we would expect, given that interglacials tend to last 10 to 11,000 years, that within the next 1,000 years, without human interference in the climate system, we would very slowly be descending back into the next ice age, driven primarily by changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Uh, but what we've seen is that we're not cooling. In fact, we are warming really rapidly. And the only way we can explain that warming is not by natural cycles uh, of changes in the amount of radiation we get from the sun because of changes in orbital cycles, or an increase in solar output, or a decrease in volcanoes. The only way we can, we can explain that warming, and we use these global climate models to actually really investigate this, is through the increase in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So the reason I can say that we are doing most of the warming is because uh, A, we know theoretically that putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere increases the temperature. We know from the ice cores that there's this really close relationship between greenhouse gases and temperature. And we've done these really cool experiments with global climate models that show no other natural variation can show uh, that temperature increase. And there's one other piece that's really cool that I didn't talk about is that uh, the warming is occurring in the lower part of uh, the atmosphere and the upper part of the lower, so the troposphere goes from zero to 10 kilometers. And so the upper part of the troposphere is cooling, which is exactly what we would predict in a world warmed by greenhouse gases. Most of the warming is happening close to the surface where there's a higher density of gases. If it was solar warming, for example, you would expect the whole atmosphere to be warming. There's, so there's some other sort of key tidbits of observational information that tell us that we're actually right on the front, that it's mostly humans. Um, so it's, I mean, to make those projections, you have to make a whole bunch of assumptions. Uh, I, I would, I could turn that question around and say what some people who don't, who think we have to keep using uh, fossil fuels will say is there's a whole bunch of people who are energy poor now. We have to get them energy. The only way we can get them energy is fossil fuels. Therefore, energy demand is going to increase in the future. So that argument is based on a whole suite of assumptions, which I would dismiss. Um, we can actually be much more efficient in the way that we use energy. So Germany uses half as much energy as we do and they sort of generate the same amount of GDP, GDP per person. Um, so uh, 
so efficiency is a key part of this. We have to become more efficient. And you know, there's lots of examples, but the, the plethora of air source heat pumps that are out in the Northeast now is a great example, right? A much more efficient system as long as it doesn't get really, really cold. Um, so, uh, I, so, so then if you say, well, let's say we're gonna make a lot of gains of inf efficiency, so we become 50% more efficient, then you actually have to generate much less energy. And we can certainly produce it, like by ramping up solar and wind, sort of if we have the political will to do it. Uh, again, there's this key issue about storage of that. So what's going to provide the base load? And short term, we have all this natural gas infrastructure, we may as well use it and fracking and it's available, but I don't think we should build any more of that infrastructure. We should really start investing in the utility scale grid storage. Uh, but short term, we have nuclear and uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. So it would require a dramatic change in a short period of time, but we have done things like that. For example, the production that we ramped up in World War II, right? We stopped building cars and we built ships and airplanes. So again, the political will, I think we could do it. But you can, you can find any projection you want if you go out there. Like impossible to, we should be drowning in solar panels because they're so easy to produce. It's a really good question. What percent of sea level rise is it? can you attribute to the glacial warming versus thermal expansion of the ocean? Right, so thermal expansion uh, is significantly less than the uh, added water. And that, and that the added water is, you can see, is beginning that exponential increase. So thermal expansion is really easy to project, right? We run the global climate models, we know how much the atmosphere is going to warm, we can model pretty well how much of that's going to go into the ocean. That's a number that we can constrain pretty well. What we can't constrain is the added water from the glaciers. So, so two to one, out of 100%, two thirds, 60 to 70% added water, 30% thermal expansion. But the increase in the future is going to be primarily as a result of, uh, of those big calving ice shelves and changes in the dynamics of ice sheets. Yes, sir. Um, so that's a really good question. Uh, I don't bring it up a lot. Uh, um, I have often gone and talked to politicians with somebody from the faith community who has, tends to have far more moral authority uh, than a scientist. And when I see them bring it up, uh, there is very little pushback. Um, and so when I bring it up, I, 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 people attack me far more on the science than when I say that this is a moral issue. Uh, interestingly enough, I will say I was really surprised at the, um, at the pushback on the Pope's encyclical about climate change that occurred. There was, you know, um, it's just all, it, was, it, was, it was just unexpected from Catholics to dismiss his perspective. And it was, I mean, it was so beautifully written. Uh, and it was, it was really an insightful piece. And he wasn't pointing fingers. And yet there was sort of the ideologically divide, which I just, you know, Rick Santorum comes to mind. It's like, what the Pope's, what's the Pope doing talking about, you know, science? And it's like, well, he's got a master's in chemistry as well as being, you know, the leader of however many, what, billion, 750 million uh, uh, people. So uh, that's, that's the, for your question, that's the pushback I've seen was really that, that they, they're going to listen to the Pope except for that encyclical on climate change. <laughs> Which is an interesting twist, I think, for somebody to... You kind of believe or you don't, right? Katrina, <laughs> Hurricane Sandy, right? Hurricane Harvey, you know, $150 billion in damage in Houston. We, like, now we're ready. Now we're, everybody's going to be pulling in the same direction and we're going to solve this problem. So, so we've thought about them as they have happened. And uh, Florence, right? I mean, M Maria. Uh, those, um, uh, those haven't been the triggers that I expected they would be. Uh, I look at those, I mean, I've mentioned them several times, those forest fires in California right now are just catastrophic. I mean, I mean 7,000 homes lost, I mean, that's equivalent to what was lost in, in Sandy, in New York, right, or, or bigger. Um, and the connection to climate change is, in the science community is rather clear. Is right? You, you change it by a degree or two Fahrenheit and you just have more fires and there's this been significant trend. So uh, maybe the, the follow on is what is uh, the big trigger going to be? And so I actually think we've seen it already and it is solar and wind costing less than coal and oil. 
And I don't think we've fully appreciated that. And I think the, the system is somewhat sort of corrupt in the Greek sense of corruption in that there's so much power that exists in the status quo of making money off fossil fuel that it's going to be really hard for that system to change. But the smart money isn't going to coal and oil right now. Maybe some gas, but not coal and oil, right? right? Our, our president has said, we're going to bring back coal. Is coal coming back? Nobody's investing in it, right? People are getting out. And so I think the event has happened. So uh, 2015 or, or 16 was the first year when more than 50% of the new energy production that came online was renewables, not including large-scale hydro, just small-scale hydro. In the, in the United States, it, that was two-thirds of the new generating coming online was uh, renewable. So I think, I think that's the event, the cost in a capitalist system is going to be the driver and it's where the smart money goes. And there's slow gradual change, but we know that these systems are not linear change, just like those calving faces, is that once people get it and once, right, it's like everybody put their money in Apple, Apple dropped 4% yesterday, did you hear that? <laughs> uh, and now maybe, sort of, you know, now the next one is renewables. I, I think that's the event. I don't think it's a catastrophic human disaster, it's an opportunity. So I'm, I, I'm getting close to a net zero uh, household. And I'm doing it not because I'm rich, because UNH doesn't pay its faculty a lot, we have a great life, but because I now have, I paid off my house, I installed solar, I got a wood pellet boiler, I get my wood pellets delivered in this fantastic truck, it's just my automobiles now where I burn fossil fuel. So I've changed my personal life. But I have worked for 20 years to change our institution through the Sustainability Institute. We are now 50% below our 2001 emissions of greenhouse gases because we've become much more energy efficient and because we get the vast majority of our power from the turnkey landfill in Rochester. We clean up that methane that comes out of the landfill, we pipe it on a 12-mile pipeline, and we burn it in a combined heat and power plant on UNH that generates our electricity and it generates the heat in winter we need for heating and it generates the heat that we need for cooling in summer via chillers. And then I'm changing my state because I'm participating in these coastal risks and hazards commissions, in climate action plans, and helping New Hampshire move. And I'm working to try and change New England by working really closely with the New, New England Municipal Sustainability Network to encourage those communities to actually uh, drive the change. It's just not enough to change yourself, but if you change yourself, your food, and where you invest your money, we can get to the right place where we need to be. Thanks for your attention. Sorry. <laughs>